Welcome and thank you for coming to the webinar series from the INEAR Foundation called Sight and Sound Bites. This bi-weekly webinar series highlights research at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. Today's topic, head and neck reconstruction, past, present, and future. I am Lawton Snyder, CEO of the INEAR Foundation. The INEAR Foundation supports research to advance care for vision, hearing, balance, voice, and cancers of the head and neck at the two world-renowned departments of ophthalmology and otolaryngology at the University of Pittsburgh. The funds we provide from the INEAR Foundation to support research are only made possible because of philanthropic support. So I always want to thank those who have supported us and, and certainly make it available for anybody who'd like to learn about how they can support programs like you're going to hear about today, or research and, and innovation like you're going to hear about today. A few housekeeping uh, things for today's webinar. Uh, you'll recognize this. This looks just like your Zoom that you do with your family at home. Um, but we're going to, uh, for this, you won't be able to chat to any of the speakers or to anybody else on the, the webinar, but we, we do want you to use your Q&A function. Q&A is at the very bottom of your screen, or at least is on my screen, a little bubble. Click on Q&A. You can type a question anytime during the program. We'll read the questions at the end and answer those as we get to them. Uh, we'll ask you to refrain from uh, asking real personal health questions, um, but certainly we will be happy to answer those offline. Um, and you can email those to uh, Mr. Craig Smith, who uh, was in your invitation. You'll receive a survey tomorrow. The survey is very important to us, so please <clears throat> complete that so that we have an idea of what you liked and what you didn't like about the, our series, and we continue to improve those throughout the year and we'll add you to our email list for future webinars. Very pleased to present today's speaker, Dr. Mark Kubik. Dr. Kubik is an assistant professor in the Department of Otolaryngology, as well as the Department of Plastic Surgery. Dr. Kubik's primary clinical interests include oncology surgery for tumors of the head and neck region, including skull base, thyroid, and salivary gland malignancies. He has a specific clinical expertise in micular, sorry, microvascular reconstruction following trauma or cancer surgery. Dr. Kubik, thank you so much for joining us and uh, looking forward to your presentation. Thanks so much, Lonnie. Uh, it really is an honor um, to, to do this talk and I uh, really appreciate the invitation and the INER Foundation for, for setting this up. You know, this is a topic that is uh, very near and dear to my heart. So I'm, I'm glad to be able to share with everyone uh, what we're doing clinically, um, and then also what we're doing from a research standpoint in our reconstructive division. So we're going to focus on that. We're going to we're going to talk a little bit about history uh, and and present and future as it relates to uh, head and neck reconstruction. So I don't have any financial disclosures. The only disclosure that I have is that uh, this uh, PowerPoint is gonna contain some graphic and gross uh, surgical uh, pictures and footage. You know, my goal was to, to take you into the operating room and actually show you what actually goes on. Um, all of the photographic and videographic information that you're gonna see, these are all patients that have um, consented to have their, um, their clinical care documented uh, for research and, and, and teaching purposes. So, you know, first and foremost, I wanted to introduce our team on the, on the reconstructive side. And so uh, we have a very busy, high volume head and neck cancer program here at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, and just to, to support that, we have a very busy reconstructive program. So there are three faculty members that are subspecialty fellowship trained microvascular surgeons, uh, myself, Dr. Mario Solari, who's a plastic surgeon, uh, plastic surgery trained microvascular surgeon, Dr. Sham Shrudran, who like myself is an otolaryngology trained uh, microvascular surgeon. So we're the, the three faculty members that are primarily involved in this clinical work, um, but we don't do it alone. Uh, we have a big team. You can see um, on the second line, uh, Spencer, Varun, and Marco are our subspecialty uh, fellows in microvascular surgery. They are fully trained otolaryngologists and plastic surgeons who are doing an extra year in microvascular work. And, and Matt Bodigal is our, our dedicated research coordinator. We maintain a prospective research database for all of this clinical work. And Matt is really integral for maintaining that. 
So why, why do we even perform reconstruction? Um, so primarily it's to reconstruct defects that result from major head and neck cancer surgery. Um, sometimes we have to reconstruct patients that have complications from non-surgical treatment of head and neck cancer that can include soft tissue necrosis after radiation. Uh, and the third ma major reason is trauma. You know, at UPMC, particularly at Montefiore and Presbyterian, we're a level one trauma center. And so we see a very high volume of maxillofacial trauma um, that uh, is a big part of our practice as well. So what I wanted to do first is actually go through a few cases that, that we have and my, I have managed over the last uh, two months. Um, so I'm gonna introduce these cases and then um, I'm gonna give you a little background and then we're gonna show how these cases were ultimately reconstructed and bring you through the whole process because I think it will shed some light into what we do and some of, the, some of the advances here at UPMC as they relate to microvascular reconstruction. So um, this was a patient, this was a 20 year old who uh, sustained a gunshot wound to the face um, and remarkably was uh, from a neurologic standpoint and globally was relatively unscathed as with the, with the exception being this, his maxillofacial injury. So you can see on these uh, 3D reconstructions of his CT scan that he has a, a, a sizable defect here of his upper jaw or the maxilla uh, with a big hole into the cheek sinus. And so he, uh, he presented here and um, he was uh, you know, treated by our reconstructive team. We'll get into his care in a, in a few moments. Uh, here's our uh, next case, case two. Um, this is a young lady, a 19 year old who presented to her dentist actually with a basically swelling of her chin. Uh, and she was noted to have a mass in the lower jaw, the mandible, and this was found to be what's called an ossifying fibroma, fibroma which is a benign fibrosseous uh, tumor of the jawbone. And it was uh, basically decided that she, she would require surgery with the maxillofacial surgery team and, and our team as well. Here's two examples recently of oral cancer. On, the, on, the, on your left, you can see this is a newly diagnosed tongue cancer involving the side of the tongue. And on the right side, this is a jaw cancer that is involving the lower jaw or mandible. So, you know, why do we really care about head and neck reconstruction and why is it such a big emphasis in our department? Well, as you can imagine from the cases that were just presented, um, these defects that result from trauma or, or major surgery can have massive cosmetic implications, functional implications as they relate to swallowing, chewing, neck motion, dis disability in, in, in a patient's airway, and, and also their quality of life. And so how we reconstruct the, these, these defects really, really does matter for patients. And so how do we, how do we actually go about doing it? Um, so, you know, there's a lot of theor theoretical ways that we can reconstruct um, patients after, after these types of insults. And, and I'm sure um, everyone watching has heard of a, a few of these things. Um, ultimately, what our practice relies most heavily on is the use of what's called a, a, a flap to reconstruct um, these defects. And a, a flap is really just a piece of a patient's own native tissue from some part of their body uh, with an independent blood supply that is used to reconstruct the area. And so that's, that's what a flap is, and we'll get more into that later. Other options um, are prosthetic obturators. You can see in the bottom right hand, uh, that's an example of a maxillary obturator. Um, and this is a basically a device that is made by a prosthodontist that can reconstruct a variety of different defects uh, within the maxillofacial skeleton and in the right patient, uh, we, we certainly utilize these uh, frequently. Um, uh, what about um, vascularized composite allo transplantation uh, or VCA? I, I'm sure people have heard of this, um, you know, in, in uh, discussion of face tram transplants and other solid organ transplants. Uh, so this is a very fascinating field. It's a field that's growing rapidly. There's a tremendous amount of research and um, you know, we've probably all seen articles re recently uh, documenting uh, the use 
Um, you know, this was a recent article in NPR about a tracheal transplant and um, this 2011 article about a voice box transplant. And so they, these things are done, but they're usually done in a very specific setting. And, and the reason why this has not gained widespread acceptance and utilization is patients have to be immunosuppressed. That is, you have to suppress their immune system and there's a risk of chronic rejection. And so those two things have really prevented allotransplantation from being a prominent reconstructive approach. Bioengineering is another really fascinating field but it's really not at the level of being able to reconstruct three-dimensional scaffolds at this point. Uh, we have a lot of very interesting products and development of skin substitutes, but we're really not at the point where we can reconstruct complex three-dimensional uh, maxillofacial structures with bioengineering yet. So, you know, how do we do this? So this whole idea of a, of a flap, you know, this is something that has been known for a long time. And so this, this is an example of flap reconstruction in the 16th century, uh, Italy. Uh, there was a famous Italian uh, surgeon uh, named uh, Tagliacozzi who became famous for nasal reconstruction and flap reconstruction. He realized that to reconstruct something with a soft tissue flap, that, that tissue required blood supply. And then if you cut the blood supply, that the tissue flap would not live. And so syphilis, interestingly enough, was rampant in, in Italy at this time. Penicillin had not been uh, discovered yet. And so patients had nasal, something called a saddle nose deformity after syphilis, which is a nasal deformity. Uh, and this is how he would reconstruct their nose. He would lift skin off the arm. He would sew it into the nasal defect and leave it there for several, several weeks until the, the flap had incorporated into the nose and, and that could be divided. So this is obviously a very unique and, and from a patient standpoint, a very uh, terrible way to undergo a reconstruction. But fundamentally, they understood the, the concept in that they, these, these tissues had to have blood supply. And this, this really was how head and neck reconstruction was initially done. So in the 1900s, as the abilities of as surgical ability progressed and anesthesia capabilities progressed, you know, head and neck surgery naturally evolved and reconstructive surgery had to parallel those developments. And how we initially reconstructed people with head and neck defects was through use of a very similar idea, using a pedicled flap, that is a flap that was attached to its donor site uh, via a blood vessel. And so one of the most, one of the first most common flaps used in head neck reconstruction was something called a delta pectoral flap, which was uh, developed in 1965. And you can see on the right side, this picture of a patient that has been reconstructed with two separate delta pectoral flaps, which are still connected to the chest wall. And so uh, pedicle flap reconstruction was, um, was just how head neck reconstruction was done. Um, the pectoralis flap was developed in 1979. Uh, this was a very similar concept where you basically took tissue of the chest wall, including the pectoralis muscle, and you rotated it up into the neck or the face and used that to reconstruct the, the defect. And so this became a work, workhorse flap in head and neck reconstruction and actually is still used today uh, in, in select uh, circumstances. But what people ultimately realize is that these regional flaps or these rotational flaps where the pedicle was still, or the blood vessel was still connected were suboptimal in many ways. Um, this is an example of something called an Andy Gump deformity. That is that this patient has had his lower jaw, the front of his lower jaw removed for cancer and reconstructed with only a soft tissue flap. And you can see how his lower jaw is completely collapsed. And this is what's called an Andy Gump deformity. And so people realized that these reconstructions were obviously not ideal in, in fully reestablishing form and function after these complex um, head and neck surgeries. So we realized that we had to do something called a free flap, which is basically take that piece of tissue connected to its blood vessel, cut the blood vessel, transplant it up to the area of interest, and re-suture the blood vessels 
so it had independent blood supply through the neck. And so that's kind of the concept of, uh, that's kind of the concept of a, of, a, of a free flap. So, you know, for this to even develop, um, this, and this is essentially microvascular surgery, vascular surgery had to evolve a little bit. So this just goes into a little bit of a history of, of how this all developed. And so in the 1800s in the Civil War, it, vascular surgery wasn't really practiced. The only vascular procedure people did was ligate uh, a blood vessel or tie it off. Uh, it wasn't until 1896 when Benjamin Murphy in Chicago described actually how to do a vascular repair. Um, and then 1912, this uh, French surgeon who actually up until this discovery was felt to be a non, not a very productive uh, academic uh, he described how to actually do a vascular anastomosis or repair and ultimately won a Nobel Prize in medicine for it. Uh, in 1916, a medical student at Hopkins discovered the medication heparin, which is kind of inherent to um, vascular surgical techniques. Um, but even up until the 1950s, um, really the dogma was that if a blood vessel was less than five millimeters, um, you couldn't really repair it. And if you tried to, it would just clot off. And so microvascular surgery wasn't uh, really something that was done at all. Uh, and it was really the absence of optics that prevented it. And so it wasn't until um, an otolaryngologist or an uh, ears, nose, and throat surgeon figured out microsurgery. And so um, Dr. Nylon is considered the father of microsurgery. He was a ENT physician in Sweden who um, realized to do complex ear surgery uh, he was an otologist. He, he had to develop a surgical microscope. So uh, he worked with uh, the, you know, Carl Zeiss um, to develop the first surgical microscope. And so this was really one of the most fundamental and important developments, both in otolaryngology and then subsequently microvascular surgery. Um, it wasn't until 1960 that we actually figured out how to do a microvascular repair or a small blood vessel repair. Um, and th these were two surgeons at the University of Vermont that were basically using a animal model and practicing repairing the carotid artery. And they, they realized that they, they couldn't see the blood vessel and they couldn't do a technical repair because it was so small. So they actually went to one of their otolaryngology colleagues and borrowed the microscope that they were using for ear surgery. And they figured out that they could do microvascular surgery with it. So that really was the, the beginnings of microvascular procedure, uh, and then the development of all the specialized instrumentation uh, naturally uh, naturally followed. Um, the first head and neck free flap that was done to reconstruct for cancer was done in New York in 1957. This was, uh, surgeons took a piece of small bowel and used it to reconstruct the esophagus. Um, and this ultimately was a a horrible failure at the time that the flap survived for a few days and then unfortunately uh, died because of a blood clot. Um, you know, from that time forward, we really had a massive expansion in what we could do with respect to reconstruction. And you can see this, this figure really shows all the, and it, this is not completely inclusive, but all the different types of flaps that across the body that we can use to reconstruct various defects uh, by transplanting them to the to the head and neck. One of the things that evolved in addition to the suture technique was some of technological advances in, in how we actually repair blood vessels. This is called a coupler. And this is basically a mechanical ring by which the edges of the blood vessel are tacked onto the ring and this thing is mechanically closed. And so it's an incredibly reliable uh, method. It's more reliable than suturing and it's about four times faster. So this was a massive development in reliable venous or vein um, uh, anastomosis or, or repair. So, you know, when microvascular reconstructive surgery actually got implemented in head and neck cancer surgery, what actually happened? Well, this, this is a nice study out of MD Anderson, where they showed that when their practice moved from these pedicle rotational flaps to free flaps, they found that the incidence of wound complications, uh, something called a fistula was much less. Um, the hospital stay was shorter. And interestingly enough, the pathologic margins or bas basically a surrogate of the quality of the cancer surgery from an oncologic standpoint was, was better. And that's because the cancer surgeons 
knew that regardless of the size of the defect they created, um, they could get patients reliably reconstructed. And so that was very, very important. And so, you know, how do we actually reconstruct a lot of these defects in the oral cavity? Well, these are a few of the flaps that we use most commonly. Uh, so when we are reconstructing something like the tongue or the floor of mouth, we use tissue from the forearm or the thigh. Uh, those are two of the most common uh, free flaps. And when we have to reconstruct bone, we often use the, the fibula bone in the lower extremity um, or the shoulder blade or, or scapula. Uh, those are the, the two of the most common procedures we, we do. And so, you know, what, what ultimately has come of this kind of new evolution of microvascular techniques? Well, as already mentioned, it reduced complications. Uh, in many ways, it improved cosmesis or how patients looked after surgery. Functional outcomes improved. Uh, patients now had the, the opportunity to have dental restoration and dental implants, which we'll get into. And also there's evidence that they have improved quality of life. So, you know, in our division, we have kind of three pillars of our practice, and that is clinical care, providing high quality reconstructive care, education, teaching our residents, teaching our fellows how to do microvascular surgery. You see on the right-hand side here, we have a dedicated microvascular lab in which um, trainees learn how to do microvascular surgery on, a, on an animal model uh, prior to implementing it in the operating room. And uh, of course, the third pillar is research, scholarship, and innovation. So, you know, what, what is new here at UPMC? What's, what's kind of on the forefront of head and neck reconstruction? Um, virtual surgical planning, which I'll get into, is one of the ways that we are pre-planning our reconstructions using computerized model, modeling, doing nerve reconstruction at the same time or innervated or neurotized reconstruction is a, not a new thing, but something that is becoming increasingly popular. Uh, dental implants and intraoperative uh, perfusion assessment, all of which I'll, I'll get into in my examples. So I'm going to get back to our cases here um, and talk about some specifics. And so, you know, even 15 to 20 years ago, this is how a jaw reconstruction was planned. It was done intraoperatively. It was free-handed. The surgeon had to basically self-create a model. As you can see, the surgeon is using a wooden tongue blade to reconstruct segments of the a jawbone intraoperatively. And so this is how mandibular or lower jaw reconstruction was done up until relatively recently. Um, and recently, we've gotten into an era of something called virtual surgical planning. That is, uh, this is our first young patient with the benign ossifying fibroma of the lower jaw, um, we were able to set, use her CT scan to create a plan of the, um, of the surgery vir virtually. Um, the oncologic surgeon will plan out where the tumor needs to be cut out. And then the reconstructive surgeon in collaboration with an engineer is able to sit down um, and plan out the details of the reconstruction in a very, very anatomically specific way. Um, in addition to that, you can see that the titanium plate that is created here is a personalized plate that is modeled perfectly to this patient's jawbone. So it allows us a tremendous amount of detail and tremendous amount of planning capabilities. You can see for this patient, we're actually, we planned primary dental implants. That is the dental implants to which the patient's dental prosthetic is going to be applied are are intricately planned within the segments of the fibular bone. And so this is a, this is a reconstruction that, that gets carried out you know, with a very high degree of accuracy and only virtual planning really facilitates this, this amount of accuracy. You can see that when we virtually plan a case like this, the, this, the, the company um, that you know, this is produced commercially that we uh, collaborate with, they generate cutting guides that is um, guides that can be applied to the patient's anatomy intraoperatively to make perfect bony segments for the reconstruction. Um, they can be applied to both the, the fibula bone and the jaw bone to make sure that where we make those bone cuts is absolutely perfect. Um, it also plans out all of the, the screw locations, so it really facilitates a very high level of accuracy. So this is an example. This is that um, pictures of this patient's reconstruction at the time of surgery. At the top left, you can see this tumor that has been removed. 
um, and all the teeth that unfortunately had to be removed at, you know, with this, with this benign tumor. On the right hand side, you can see this is the patient's fibula, a lower extremity bone that has been harvested and has been carefully molded to the shape of a new jawbone. And you can see the small titanium implants that are the dental implants um, that have been already placed by the maxillofacial surgeon at the time of the harvest. And then at the bottom left, you can see this completely inset into the defect and ready to be sutured closed. And so um, you can see that the amount of precision that, that this technique provides. This is our patient with the gunshot wound. Uh, he had a very similar procedure. This was the upper jaw, and you can see he has a, a pre-fabricated plate and pre-planned bony reconstruction here that allows us to carry out a very, very specific plan for this patient. And, and we, we, as you can see here, we have a craniofacial model in the operating room that we can, we, we basically have a perfect model to which we compare our reconstruction and make sure that we are, um, we are basically, we have a perfect design going into the inset of this flap. And then you can see this patient at three months out, his upper jaw is completely healed. He doesn't have a, a hole into the cheek, into the cheek sinus, and he's ready for his dental implants that are going to be performed in his case in a secondary setting. And so what does this really do when we do these, you know, computer model jaw reconstructions? Well, not surprisingly, it reduces our operative time because we don't have to, you know, create a model ourselves uh, freehanding this. And so we're faster. We have improved accuracy. Uh, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that our cancer outcomes are no different when we pre-plan the cuts. Uh, and we also have reduced bony complications just because the bony reconstruction is more precise. And there's no difference in the, the acute complications of this major surgery. A few of the things we're doing here at UPMC as it relates to virtual planning is we're trying to figure out, you know, is this a cost-effective approach? We know it's a helpful approach. We know it saves time, but it's also expensive. Uh, these plans can cost several thousand dollars. And so we're, we're trying to figure out, is it cost effective? Are there certain patients in whom it's required? Are there, cert in, are there certain patients in whom it might be optional and may not impact the repair? So that's an active area of research here. In a similar way, we're, we're applying the same concept to simple jaw fractures that, that, um, that occur from trauma. I thought I'd include this. Um, this is an example of uh, a patient that uh, has had a jaw reconstruction with a fibula. Um, he had implants placed at the time of surgery, and you can see his titanium implants there, and then the custom-made prosthetic that our prosthodontist has made for him, uh, which is pretty incredible and sits right there on his newly reconstructed uh, lower jaw so that he can chew effectively. So. Um, you know, we're doing nerve reconstruction at the time of these cases. You can see this is an example of a jaw reconstruction during which we are, we, in addition to reconstructing the bone, we reconstructed the nerve, uh, and this improves patient's sensation and function after the, after the procedure. Um, this was uh, the patient with tongue cancer that we just presented. Uh, we actually just finished this case a couple days ago. You can see her tongue was reconstructed with a piece of vascularized tissue from her thigh. Um, and and the, the nerve was reconstructed also with a nerve that was going into this piece of thigh tissue. And so she, she had what's called a sensate uh, free flap. You know, we have sophisticated methods to facilitate neural preservation by which just in the same way we plan the bony reconstruction, we actually we can plan out how we elevate the nerve during these reconstructions, which um, improves our ability to functionally pervert um, provide sensation. Uh, this is an example uh, of a patient with a facial paralysis. So this patient had a facial paralysis from a autoimmune disorder. And this is an example of what's called a gracilis free flap. This is a muscle to reconstruct facial motion. And so we, we, this muscle is harvested from the leg with the nerve intact with the plan for it being to reconstruct facial muscle to facilitate movement. So I'm gonna click on this here. You'll be able to see in, in the leg, this muscle contracting as we're stimulating the obturator nerve for this flap. And so this is the, the flap in the leg. And then this is 
the, the patient, at the end of the procedure, we're able to stimulate the nerve and actually facilitate facial motion. And so this is one of the ways that we reconstruct dynamic smile in patients that have a facial paralysis. So that's one additional utilization of microvascular reconstruction. We have very sophisticated Im imaging now with CT angiograms, or that is CT scans that very specifically pick up blood vessel patterns. And we're able to very specifically plan out components to these flaps and avoid complications that arise from patients having insufficient uh, blood vessels to, to support such a reconstruction. So this is a major part of our practice now that we're collaborating with uh, radiology with. Um, we're doing a lot of intraoperative perfusion assessment. This is a very, very cool device that allows us to assess blood flow. So, you know, these reconstructions are inherently very dependent on blood flow through the system. And if they don't have blood flow, they die. And so this, uh, we give a IV dye that then fluoresces under, under this, uh, this very specialized camera and allows us to test the blood flow to a reconstruction. So this was a, th uh, a thigh flap that we did a, um, a few weeks ago. And we're, um, I'm gonna show you us injecting the dye and testing the blood supply to this reconstruction as it's in the leg before we bring it up to the head and neck. So you can see the anesthesiologist is gonna uh, inject this uh, dye. And if the flap is alive, it's gonna slowly creep through the tissue. And you can see this flap is a, has a wonderful blood supply and is, is ready for, for a transfer up to the head and neck for reconstruction of the scalp uh, in, in this case. So this is indocyanine green is the, is the medication we give for this. It's a really powerful technique. Um, this, is, this, is another, uh, this is another example. This is us after we've done the microvascular work. That is, we've hooked up the blood vessels in the neck, and now we're going to give the dye, and we're going to check the patency of the blood vessels after we inject the dye. And this is one way of just verifying the integrity of the microvascular repair after we've sutured this under the microscope. So the, so the anesthesiologist is going to give this dye, and you can see the artery lighting up there first, uh, and the flap lighting up here on the right side. This this thing has a, a nice blood supply, and then the vein fi finally lighting up. So this is a great confirmation of of great flow through the flap, and and tends to be a good prognostic indicator for flap uh, survival. So just. A quick note on, on the postoperative care. So we continuously monitor these uh, after surgery. And so um, we place these tiny cuffs around the blood vessels, um, which allow us after the patient's surgery, for the first four or five days after surgery, we can monitor blood, uh, blood supply. And so I put this in here just so you have an idea. This is uh, at the bedside uh, in the patient's hospital room and allows us to constantly follow um, the blood flow. So it's an audible sound and it allows the uh, nurses to um, monitor the blood flow every one, off, one hour. And uh, this is just another example of, uh, this is after the microvascular work has been completed. Uh, and uh, we are just uh, checking the patency of the part that's a little bit uh, loud. So we, you know, we've got a couple, um, well, several ongoing prospective investigations into, you know, how can we make this surgery better for patients, less complicated, get them out of the hospital faster, and improve their outcomes. And so we're looking at, you, you know, studying people's drains for a chemical called amylase to predict wound complications. Uh, we also have a prospective trial of a medication called phenobarbital to prevent alcohol withdrawal, which unfortunately tends to be a not in common um, uh, clinical problem that we, we deal with in many of our patients. And, and we also have a few studies looking at the objective consequence of uh, doing surgery on these flap donor sites. So obviously, anytime we do a reconstructive surgery, we are uh, borrowing from Peter to pay Paul. And so, um, and there's not a tremendous amount of objective data known about the consequences of taking tissue from the leg or taking it from the arm. Uh, and so we're trying to add to the literature uh, in understanding that. Uh, a few potential future applications. And so lymphedema surgery, which has become common in breast cancer, um, 
management um, has not really been applied to head and neck surgery. And um, lymphedema, neck lymphedema tends to be a very, very common problem that uh, many of our patients uh, suffer with. Um, and so microsurgery has been applied to lymphedema in the, in the setting of breast cancer uh, to improve patient symptomatology uh, through basically repairing very, very small uh, lymph vessels through supramicrosurgery. So that's something that we're looking into here at UPMC to see how we can apply that to the head and neck. And the second thing is robotic microsurgery. Obviously, right now, this is all done with the human hand under a microscope, under a microscope um, which has very high reliability. You know, the survival of a microvascular free flap is, is approximately 97%. And so this is a very effective way, but undoubtedly, the, our technology in robotics is advancing at such a, such a rapid pace. I have no doubt that in a few years, we're going to have robots that are able to independently perform a microvascular anastomosis or with a surgeon control, uh, be able to perform a microvascular anastomosis uh, in an even more reliable fashion through improved optics and, um, and uh, technical ability. So uh, that was the content I was going to present. I know that was... Uh, it's probably a whirlwind tour, and I'm sure there are some questions that I'm, I'm happy to take, but I appreciate everyone's attention, and uh, we'll open it up to questions now. Oh, my goodness. Uh, Dr. Kubik, that was really fascinating. I, I, um, uh, I can only imagine for some who maybe aren't as used to seeing this, this type of stuff, and I've seen a lot of it, but that was very, very fascinating. Um, I'm, I'm really... Uh, taken away by how much technology and innovation goes into this. How closely do you have to work with um, engineers to be able to do some of the planning that you've done in, in terms of preparing for some of these surgeries? Every day. I mean, it's, it's truly remarkable. So, you know, it's, and it's so different than the practice of reconstruction even 20 years ago. So right now, when I, when I see a patient in the clinic that needs a jaw reconstruction, for example, and I'll X out of here, um, the, one of the first things I do that day is to reach out to our engineering team. Um, and I, you know, we reach out, both myself and the oncologic surgeon, to the engineering team, and we let them know that we have this case to plan, because the, the planning takes about two weeks. They upload all the patient's CT scans, and we set up a formal design meeting, uh, usually very, very quickly, and it takes about 30 to 45 minutes per patient to sit down. So two surgeons, one design engineer, plan out all of these very, very minute details uh, of the case. And so it adds a tremendous value, but it's, a, it's also time consuming, for sure. So I imagine that the, you know, the well, I mean, the sky's the limit, but there's there's got to be so many, um, you know, uh, innovations coming out that are potentially very helpful to, you know, what you're trying to do from an engineering perspective and a design perspective to try to do some of this really complicated work. Um, are, are, how, how many people are working on this? Just in the, in the research community? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I, I think Virtual surgical planning for jaw reconstruction in major academic cancer centers has really become the standard of care. Um, and so I think almost everyone recognizes now that this helps patients. And so I think our focus now and the research focus of many academic microvascular surgeons is number one, how can we make it better? How can we make it cheaper? Um, and how can we make it faster? And so that's our focus. And, and here at UPMC, what's, a, what's amazing is, you know, we've historically collaborated with private industry for these plans. And so the uh, few major companies that we collaborate with that do these plans. But now here at UPMC, we have a dedicated, dedicated 3D printing lab and um, a very, very amazing uh, radiology department such that we essentially have all of this software and all of this planning capability in-house. And so we are going to have the ability now that instead of contracting out to a private company, we're going to be able to plan these things here in our department, reduce costs significantly, uh, and hopefully have no impact on the outcomes. And so there's, there's a lot of development to come here. 
Well, that's fantastic. I, I'm going to get to the questions for those who are asking questions. Thank you. It's time to ask questions. You can type them into uh, the bubble in the bottom here. But I have one more. I, you know, I, I realize you're doing these surgeries through looking through a microscope and, you know, you're sewing very, very, you know, fine motor skills to, tr to try to sew a, a vein to a vein or an artery to an artery or a nerve to a nerve. <laughs> Can you drink coffee? <laughs> I mean, is that allowed? Or how do you manage like tremor and things of that nature so that you? Uh... Yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating question. Um, and uh, because surgical tremor is something that is not really compatible with doing microvascular uh, surgery. And so um, there is a tremendous amount of literature and things that have been written on how to avoid tremor. But I think what the ultimate conclusion that everyone has reached is that you you very much have to have a regimen um, and caffeine is fine so long as you maintain your normal caffeine intake. And so I usually have a venti uh, coffee every morning, but um, I actually find that if I don't drink my coffee, my, I will have a tremor. And, oh. so, um, and, and vice versa, if I drink more than my standard amount of caffeine that I'll drink, um, you know, you can develop a tremor. So I think most microvascular surgeons have basically found their own personal sweet spot uh, as it relates to caffeine, as it relates to sleep. When you're sleep deprived, the, the more mentally or physically fatigued you are, the more generalized motor tremor you have. Uh, and so all these things are impactful. So one of the, one of the things that I realized in my training is Sometimes the night before surgery, I would go to the gym and I would, I'd be in the gym and I would be lifting weights. And then the next day I'd be under the scope and I would have a tremor. And I would notice that certain days when I skipped working out the night before, I wouldn't have a tremor. And when I would work out, I did have a tremor. And so I, I realized for myself that if, if I did major strength training before a surgery like this, I, I just couldn't do as good a job. And so it's, uh, there's a lot of things in terms of caffeine and your daily routine and sleep that, that go into maintaining a high level of technical skill. Very, very interesting. Well, we're getting more and more questions. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna get to these. Um, what's up and coming technology or instruments are on the horizon that can make a big improvement in outcomes for head, neck, cancer, uh, facial reconstruction? So up and coming technology. Um, so we, I mean, I think all of the areas that, that we've talked about, there, there, are, there are new innovations in all, all these kind of realms. And so within microvascular surgery, uh, one of the very cool things is that, um, you know, I presented a little bit the monitor that we use that is attached with a wire to the blood vessels inside a patient allows us to monitor the blood flow. So um, we are in the process of working to develop a remote option that is a coupler that is totally wireless that syncs up with a, a remote technology such as your cell phone to continuously monitor blood flow such that you know, if one of my patients has a blood clot, I get a notification to my phone via a remote alarm, an automated alarm. So that's, that's one cool development in microvascular surgery. Another one is, um, this idea of mechanical coupling that is totally avoiding suturing a blood vessel altogether. So we usually suture arteries because that is kind of the fundamental and time-tested technique. But the, the, just like vein coupling now, there's also new devices out there to couple arteries to make arterial repair five times faster. So that's going to be on the horizon. Virtual surgical planning, we, we kind of went through it. It's, it's constantly evolving um, and nerve reconstruction the same. You know, previously, like reconstructing neural function or motor function in head and neck reconstruction just wasn't a priority. People were happy just to kind of the, fill the defect with tissue to prevent wound complications. And I think we have, we have a much more nuanced approach now where we're not only are we focused on let's just fix this wound and put some healthy tissue up there. We're thinking about, well, how are we gonna optimize function so that in five, 10 years, this patient can speak, swallow, talk, um, move their face. And so there's a lot of innovation on the, on the forefront. All fantastic. 
So um, what kind of long-term effects can these surgeries have, even though they are optimized to be minimally invasive? Well, I, I guess I, I, I would say that there's nothing minimally invasive about free flap reconstruction. I mean, these are, in many ways, unfortunately, these are maximally invasive because you've got, this is an eight or nine hour surgery. You have two surgical teams operating on a patient at the same time, uh, cancer team, reconstructive team. Um, and so, um, you know, the, it's, these, these surgeries have a tremendous physiologic impact on patients um, and, uh, you know, often are associated with a fairly raw, uh, long uh, recovery. Uh, that being said, we are looking into ways to, number one, speed up the recovery, make the inpatient admit, admission shorter, and we're finding ways with how we do the reconstruction to optimize kind of long-term swallowing function. So there's a lot of things that, that go into it. Are there any particular drugs or pharmaceutical treatments that can help these surgeries be successful short-term or long-term? You know, not, not really. So I, I think almost every microvascular reconstructive practice, we, we do use blood thinners. And so um, there's some variability in terms of what blood thinners people use, but we, we keep patients on aspirin. So, and so we find that um, the medication aspirin, we keep patients on that every day after a surgery like that, that helps to prevent blood clots. And we also use medication that is used to prevent leg blood clots or deep vein thrombosis, uh, something called Lovenox. That's also given to patients twice a day after these surgeries. So the, the, the primary medical intervention they get is um, something to thin the blood to prevent the blood from clotting at the site of the repair. Very interesting. So um, is there a micro da Vinci for vascular surgery? So great question. So there, there is, um, and I, actually I should say there are. So the number one, the da Vinci robot, which is probably the most widely used, utilized surgical robot that we use in head and neck surgery a lot for cancer surgery. Um, there are actually micro instruments that can be used for the da Vinci. And so they make a small subset of instruments that you can actually perform a microvascular anastomosis with the da Vinci robot. Um, and we've tried this in the lab here, and we've, we've had some um, kind of animal model experience with it. And the problem is, even though the technical finesse is there, the problem with the da Vinci is that, number one, the instruments aren't perfect. And then it also doesn't have something called haptic feedback. That is, when you touch something on the da Vinci robot and you're on the surgeon console, you can't feel resistance. And so something that's inherent to microvascular surgery, you have to have a very, very fine touch. And without feeling resistance, it's very hard to do a very technically precise microvascular repair. There are a few other robots that are in varying stages of development that are actually much more well-designed specifically for microvascular surgery none of which have really made it to prime time, but I'm sure five, 10 years, this is how we're going to be doing this surgery because there's no doubt that a robot can do this surgery better than a human hand. Unfortunately, I'm, I'm, I might be out of a job in, in 10, 15 years. We'll see. <laughs> I, I highly doubt it because I think, I think the surgeon's still going to have a pretty important role in that. So um, in head and neck cancer cases, to what extent can the reconstruction or function uh, at risk from post-surgery radiation therapy? And um, I'm sorry, uh, to what extent is the reconstruction of function of, at risk from radiation therapy? And would proton therapy be better from a standpoint of preserving the reconstruction without compromising survival from the cancer? Um, so the radiation therapy has a huge impact on the reconstruction. Um, and I would say the need for radiation therapy, which is generally present in most patients that require reconstruction, these are often patients that have advanced stage tumors that will then require radiation. And so our decision making, number one, whether to do a reconstruction, and number two, what type of reconstruction to do, is very, very heavily influenced by radiation. And so Radiation therapy causes fibrosis or scar tissue. And so that impacts how we design our reconstructions. We know that when one of our flap reconstructions is radiated by conventional techniques, um, it loses about 20 to 30% of its volume. And so um, that 
that's important because if we reconstruct somebody's tongue, say, with a soft tissue flap, and then it loses 30% of its volume, well, then in six months, that patient may have a suboptimal functional outcome if the tongue looks perfect at the end of the surgery. And so what we find is when we know patients are going to have radiation, we often over reconstruct them. That, that is, we give them a little bit too much volume, uh, maybe 20, 30% extra so that when they get radiation and things shrink and, and scar, they're left with a better functional outcome. I would say as it relates to standard external beam radiation versus proton, um, I wouldn't, there's not a lot of literature or data out there that, that one of those affects reconstructions differently. Obviously, proton beam radiation, large particle radiation has very specific theoretical benefits, but is only available at a few centers. Um, and, and we, uh, here at UPMC, proton therapy is not really commonly, um, commonly done. It's all incredibly fascinating. And, and you know what? I am really very glad that we recorded today's session because I think this is a very helpful uh, tool for people maybe who are considering this type of, of procedure or, or, um, or, or wondering what it's like to undergo it. So thank you so much for doing this for us today. Thank you, all of you who attended today's audience. Of course, as I said, this will be recorded. It'll be posted on our INEAR Foundation website for viewing. And um, you'll also receive... Uh, a copy of it sent to you via email. Thank you everybody um, for spending time with us on this again, beautiful sunny day here in Pittsburgh and uh, look forward to catching uh, some of you maybe in a few weeks as we present the next topic for Sight and Sound Bites. Uh, have a wonderful day. Thanks so much, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much.